بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد um, firstly apologize I have a bit of a allergy issue today so I might be sniffling uh, we had discussed in our last lesson of Ali uh, ibn Abi Talib رضي الله تعالى عن uh, the issue of the bay'ah the issue of giving the oath of allegiance to Abu Bakr al-Siddiq رضي الله عنه and I had clarified last time that uh, it is very clear uh, from all historical textbooks that eventually Ali ibn Abi Talib gave the bay'ah. So we clarified that perhaps there might have been some initial tensions between Ali and Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu ajma'in over the issue of, there were two major issues, the issue of khilafah and the issue of, what was the second issue? Inheritance, fadak, fadak, inheritance, yes. Uh, and uh, I had mentioned that uh, in this hadith is in Sahih Bukhari, that Abu Bakr al-Siddiq wanted to go speak with the Banu Hashim privately. And Umar ibn Khattab had said, let me come with you. Don't go alone. Maybe they'll convince you of something other than that. And, Ali, uh, so, and Abu Bakr al-Siddiq said, what would they do to me? I mean, what is the, how, you think I'm not going to be able to uh, negotiate with them? What are they going to do to me? So he went and the Banu Hashim uh, had gathered together. And this is right after the death of Fatima radiallahu anha. And uh, Ali uh, radiallahu an uh, said, we do not deny any privilege that you have, O Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, but we feel that you have been hasty in this regard. So this hadith, uh, I'm paraphrasing from Sahih Bukhari, it clearly demonstrates, and I believe honesty is always the best policy, it clearly demonstrates that there was this notion that you were extremely hasty, you could have waited, and there is no denying that Ali radiallahu ta'ala an felt that there's a possibility that he should be the Khalifa. There's a possibility. There's no denying this. There's no theology involved. Neither Ali nor Abu Bakr as-Siddiq are saying the Prophet said this. This is the key point. This is a matter of personal opinion. Ali radiallahu an feels that, you know, I was a legitimate candidate. And wallahi, he was a legitimate candidate, but not the right time. His time's going to come. It's not as if he's not in the top 10 or even the top 5. He is, but not now. Your time is not now. So Ali radiallahu an, he felt this and Abu Bakr as-Siddiq clarified. And Abu Bakr as-Siddiq gave an emotional khitab, emotional lecture in which he began to cry. And he said, Wallahi la qarabatu Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ahabba ilayhi min qarabati. That the family of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is more beloved to me than my own family. The family of the Prophet is more beloved to me than my own family. But he felt that this was for the betterment of the Ummah. And he reassured Ali radiallahu anh, of his love and his status. And therefore the next day, and this is two, three days after the death of Fatima. The next day, Ali radiallahu anh, took the oath of allegiance in the masjid in front of everybody to Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. And... We said this is the majority opinion that that was the first time he took the oath of allegiance. There's another opinion based on a, a narration uh, in uh, the Mustadrak of Al-Hakim that Ali took it before and this is the second time he's doing it. Now in either scenario, even if we say it's the second time, clearly it demonstrates that there was some underlying qila wa qal going on in the background. Because why is Ali radiallahu anh, even if we say it's the second time, why is he doing the oath of allegiance over again and nobody else is. There is murmurs and chatters in the background if we say it was the second time. And if we say it was the first time, then it is as we said, that there was indeed some minor tension. And I believe that when you speak the truth in this manner, you actually quell the refutations that are going to come afterwards. Because if we pretend that there was nothing at all, and if we present a false picture, it is very easy for the other group to pick a hadith in Bukhari and Muslim and show us, guys, what are you talking about? And unfortunately, I have to say, many modern Sunni shuyukh and khutaba and, and historians, they like to sugarcoat. And they like to think it's best to just tell you guys a nice, you know, um, beautified picture. And perhaps in some time and place, we could have said it may be for the best, Allah knows best, uh, even though we could still, there's no such thing as a good lie. But the fact of the matter is, these days, this type of talk is not going to fly. Be honest, be truthful, and you will always win in the long run, even if you, even if you bring some irritation in the short term. So it is very clear that there was some minor tension. 
not to the extent of hating, cursing, not to the extent of using vulgarities, and most importantly, neither side is saying the other one is sinful. Neither side is quoting Quran and Sunnah. Neither side is saying the Prophet said I should be. No, the Prophet said I should be. This is what's going to happen later on amongst the followers of these two strands. Amongst the followers of these two strands, they will then begin to read in that, oh, the Prophet explicitly said. And the fact of the matter is he didn't explicitly. He implied. He implied. He did not explicitly say that the one after me to be Khalifa is going to be Abu Bakr, but he got as close as he could without saying that. Hinting and isharat. So, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq clarified the matter to Ali radiallahu anh, and after this clarification, it is very clear that Abu Bakr and Ali radiallahu anhum, as they say, they buried these grievances, and they lived together as comrades as brothers in Islam and they cooperated together for the betterment of the ummah and they got along completely fine and this is the reality of every single incident narrated in the history books. During the wars of the Ridda, when Abu Bakr al-Siddiq wanted to fight the Murtaddin, in fact Umar was the one who told him don't fight, remember? Ali radiallahu an suggested we should fight. Ali sided with Abu Bakr al-Siddiq and he said anything that anybody does in contradiction to the Prophet ﷺ, anybody that gives less than they used to, then they have disobeyed Rasulullah ﷺ and we should fight them. And it is authentically narrated that in one of the very first battles, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, as was his usual custom in the time of the Prophet ﷺ, he began to join the group and he took his camel out and he put it outside the masjid and after the salah he went onto the camel in order to lead the expedition to fight the the uh, the, uh, the, the Banu Hanifa the Murtaddin and Ali radiallahu anhu walked outside and held on to the camel Ali radiallahu anhu this is in the first few months of Abu Bakr's Khilafah Ali radiallahu anhu holds on to the stirrup or the, the reins of the camel and he said I say to you today what the Prophet said to you at the battle of Uhud I say to you today what the Prophet ﷺ said to you in the battle of Uhud, put your sword back in and let not the news of your death come to us and return. let us return to Medina. Now, this is a reference to uh, when the core people were defending the Prophet ﷺ. Abu Bakr did not, uh, the Prophet ﷺ did not allow Abu Bakr to go to the forefront. Remember in that core, uh, the, the, the cave that they were in, and one Sahabi after another, the Prophet ﷺ did not allow Abu Bakr to go because he needed Abu Bakr in the long run. He couldn't have him at this point in time. So Ali, who knows this whole episode, he said, I'm saying to you exactly like the Prophet ﷺ said, we cannot afford to lose you. Put your sword back and come back to Medina. Do not go out, for by Allah, if you are killed now, then Islam will never have a nizam after you. If you go, we won't ever have a nizam after you. So this clearly demonstrates that Ali radiallahu anh understood Abu Bakr's status in the ummah. That the amount of respect that Abu Bakr had, that the amount of leadership he had, the ummah needed it. And it is narrated in the Mustad Imam Ahmad that uh, Ali uh, uh, radiallahu anh was outside with his children, Hassan and Hussein, and all of them were playing, the Hassan and Hussein were playing with the children of Medina as children play, and Abu Bakr passed by, and he recognized Hassan from amongst the children, and he picked up Hassan, and he threw him in the air, as you do with children, and he versified a line of poetry. Bi'abi shabihan nabi, laysa shabihan bi'ali. That I swear, this child looks like the Prophet, he doesn't look like Ali. Okay? So looking at Hassan radiallahu an reminded him of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And when he was saying these lines, Ali began to laugh. And this demonstrates the cordiality between them. It demonstrates there was an actual ukhuwa between them. And it is narrated as well. Now, by the way, so the purpose of today's lecture, one of the main purposes is to demonstrate that Ali radiallahu an had no ill will towards Abu Bakr and Umar. That Ali radiallahu an just like any two people have tensions, there might have been these tensions. Wallahi, no two people, except that something happens between the two of them. Correct? No two brothers or cousins or colleagues or friends, once in a while things happen. And this is the same way that happened with Ali and Abu Bakr in the beginning. That there was some minor tension, 
and Ali felt something. And Abu Bakr explained and clarified. After that, we demonstrate over and over again that there's no ill will. And that's really one of the main purposes of the entire lecture today. Uh, and in one narration in the Mustadrak of Al-Hakim, it's uh, reported with an authentic chain that whenever Abu Bakr was mentioned in front of Ali, he would pra praise him. Whenever Ali heard the name Abu Bakr, he would praise him. And one day, Ali said to his students, when they mentioned Abu Bakr, he said, That is the one who preceded all of us. Sabaqa. Sabaq. He's the one who preceded, preceded all of us. For by Allah, we never did any good except that Abu Bakr was ahead of us. And it is reported in the uh, book of Al-Mustarak as well, that one day Ali was giving the khutbah, or a khutbah, not the khutbah of Jum'ah, a khutbah here means a maw'idha or a, a khatira. And he said, Man ashja'un nas? Who is the bravest of all people? They said, you are. He said, no. That is Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. For on the day of Badr, we made a shelter for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and we began to discuss who will be his guard on this day and no one stood up other than Abu Bakr as-Siddiq and he was the one who walked with his sword outside unsheathed every time somebody would come close he would be the one engaged with him and I saw myself this is Ali speaking I saw myself one day when the Quraysh had surrounded the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in front of the Kaaba and they began to harass and prod him and push him and they said you are the one saying that our guards are false you are the one saying that there's only one God and nobody came to defend the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam other than Abu Bakr now pause here this is the famous story of Abu Bakr getting beaten up right black and blue when he was beaten up that early time this is that story Ali was how old nine ten years old what's he gonna do Right? It's not nothing, it's not a naqs of his, not, how can he? Ibn Mas'ud is not a Qurashi. The others can do nothing. And this is Abu Lahab and the seniors of the Quraysh. This is Abu Jahl and the seniors of the Quraysh are surrounding the Prophet ﷺ. What can the other people do? They need another person from the pure Quraysh who can go and defend. And nobody was there at the time. And therefore, nobody came other than Abu Bakr and Ali said at that time in the in the history of uh, in the, his life Abu Bakr had two you know, ponytails though this was the Arabs would have their hair in the back this is in the early days obviously later on this was then uh, uh, not abrogated but it was discouraged but in early Islam in pre-Islam and in early Islam the Arabs had they would have their hair uh, put in a, a, a ponytail like this you know the braids so he had these two braids and he was the one Abu Bakr as Siddiq was the one who began pushing and shoving people off the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he said أَتَقْتُلُونَ رَجُلًا أَنْ يَقُولَ رَبِّيَ اللَّهِ وَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ بِالْبَيْنَاتِ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ Now this phrase was later revealed in the Quran and we recite it to this day but when Abu Bakr said it, it was not in the Quran أَتَقْتُلُونَ رَجُلًا أَنْ يَقُولَ رَبِّيَ اللَّهِ وَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ بِالْبَيْنَاتِ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ Are you going to kill somebody? Just because he says, my Lord is Allah. You're going to kill somebody just because he says, my Lord is Allah. And he has come to you with signs from your Lord. So Ali says that the people began beating him up and he lost his braids. Like, can you imagine? Like people pulled him and beat him so bad that his braids got, his hair got ripped out, you can say, of his scalp. This is how bad he was uh, beaten up. Then Ali said, I ask you by Allah, who is better? The Mu'min of Ali Fir'aun or Abu Bakr as-Siddiq? The Mu'min of Ali Fir'aun is the one in Surah Ghafir. We learn about somebody who was a believer of Ali Fir'aun. The secret person in the palace of Ali Fir'aun. So they said, which one is better? So they were quiet. Then Abu Bakr said, uh, Ali said, one day of the life of Abu Bakr is better than the life of the Mu'min of Ali Fir'aun. Why? Because the mu'min of Ali Fir'aun hid his iman. And Abu Bakr never hid his iman. So this narration again shows the praise that uh, Ali had for Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. And in fact there is even a hadith narrated 
by Ali from Abu Bakr from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's a beautiful hadith and it has a phrase praising Abu Bakr as well. Only one hadith like this as far as I could find. Ali, Abu Bakr, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this is in the Muslim Imam Ahmed that Ali said that every time anybody else narrated to me about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam anything, if I hadn't heard it myself, I would stop him and ask him to make halaf billah that he heard it. Like I want to be sure that he heard it. And then I would act upon it after he had sworn. So this is Ali making uh, tathabbut is called, he's making verification. And many scholars say that the origins of the science of hadith, it goes back to the time of the Sahaba themselves, how they would verify what they would do. They wouldn't just take anything. They would verify who said it. Are you sure you heard it? And the Sahaba didn't lie. So Ali wanted to make sure. Are you 100% sure there's no error, no mistake? This is your memory is accurate. When they would swear, then he would accept this hadith. Then he said, and Abu Bakr narrated to me, and Abu Bakr always speaks the truth that the Prophet ﷺ said. Meaning what? He did not have to verify. Right? وَحَدَّثَنِي أَبُو بَكَرْ وَقَدْ صَدَقَ أَبُو بَكَرْ I don't need to verify from Abu Bakr. Right? So this is a hadith in our sources in Muslim Imam Ahmad where Ali is saying anybody else I got to verify. But I'm telling you Abu Bakr told me and I'm also explaining why I didn't verify. I didn't need to verify. Abu Bakr Sadaq. He is a Siddiq. And by the way, what is the hadith? It's a good hadith. All of you should memorize it and act upon it. That the Prophet Sallallahu said that, and this is an authentic hadith narrated in other books as well, no Muslim ever commits a sin and then performs wudu perfectly and prays two raka'ah and then yastaghfirullah, accept that Allah forgives his sin. Okay? So this is the salah that is done after committing a sin. Some call it salat at tawbah, but I mean the point is, after you commit a sin, then it is recorded in the sunnah. It's not a problem that you do this hadith, that it's a good hadith to do. Actually, this is a, a, a sunnah as well that you should do it. That if you truly want forgiveness for a sin, then do wudu perfectly. Tamam uh, al-wudu, uh, I forgot to translate. That whoever does wudu and he atam al-wudu, he does it perfectly. And then he prays two raka'at perfectly. And then he asks Allah for forgiveness that Allah Azza wa Jal will forgive his sin. Okay? So this hadith is narrated in other sources as well. But in this Musnad Imam Ahmad, we get one fa'ida, one nukta. What is that? Ali from Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. Okay? So this is the hadith that Ali narrated from him. And Ali radiallahu an as well said during his khilafah that the one who shall get the most reward regarding the mushafs on the day of judgment is Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. For he was the first one to compile the Mus'haf. For he was the, one, the first one to compile the Mus'haf. So during the time of Ali, um, the people began criticizing things of the past. And they also criticized uh, Uthman's burning of the Mus'haf. And Ali radiallahu an said, do not criticize Uthman for burning of the Mus'haf. For wallahi, he only did that because all of us suggested him to do it. And then he said, and the one who got the most ajr for the Qur'an is Abu Bakr. Because Abu Bakr was the first one to do jama' of the Qur'an. And Ali as well was put in charge of uh, being a judge in the time of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. And he was also of those who was of the shura of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. And he participated in a number of qital against the murtaddin. And Ali radiallahu an was gifted by Abu Bakr a milk yameen. Uh, one of the uh, Milk Yameen, one of the right hand possessions uh, from the battles of Yamama, from the tribe of Banu Hanifa, a lady by the name of Khawala binti Ja'far. Khawala binti Ja'far. And from this Khawala, Ali had his most famous sons after Hassan and Hussein. Who is his most famous sons after Hassan and Hussein? Most famous son after Hassan and Hussein? Muhammad ibn al Hanafiya. Muhammad ibn al Hanafiya, and he is called the son of the Hanafiya. He is not called Muhammad ibn Ali, even though he is Ibn Ali. But he's always called after his mother in order to separate him from Hassan and Hussein of Fatima. So he's called Muhammad ibn al Hanafiya. 
So the mother of Muhammad ibn al-Hanafiyya was Abu Bakr's uh, gift to Ali ibn Abi Talib for his uh, qital in the days of the Ridda. And Muhammad al-Hanafiyya, by the way, has a long and interesting history, and that's a separate uh, history altogether. And we also have in our hadith books many narrations about Ali radiallahu an praising Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. Many explicit narrations about Ali praising Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. In fact, in Sahih al-Bukhari, our most authentic book, we have from his son Muhammad ibn al-Hanafiyya, Muhammad ibn al-Hanafiyya, uh, that he asked Ali radiallahu an, I asked my father, who was the best person after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? So Ali says, Abu Bakr. Muhammad ibn al-Hanafiyya says, then who? He says, Umar. Muhammad ibn Hanafiya says, فَخَشِيتُ أَنْ يَقُولَ Uthman." I was scared that if I ask him again, he might say Uthman. So I said, ثُمَّ أَنْتَ يَا أَبِي You must be number three. And Ali radiallahu anhu said, مَا أَنَا إِلَّا رَجُلٌ مِنَ الرِّجَالِ I'm just a man amongst the men. Don't put me that high. This is his modesty. Now, it is very clear from this narration, which is in Sahih Bukhari, which is in Sahih Bukhari, that there were notions amongst that generation beginning that who is the best. And there was a hope, especially amongst those who loved Ali radiallahu an, that he might be the best. But Ali himself did not believe this. But this is going to happen later on in the third, fourth generation after Ali radiallahu an, that this notion will grow and grow and grow. Right now we see not even the seed. We see even the precursor to the seed. Not even the seed we see it. But it is already beginning. And again, let us be frank with our own sources. We have one of the sons of Ali hesitant to hear Ali number four. He wants him even to be number three. It's human nature. You want your person to be higher. There's nothing wrong with this per se. Unfortunately, later groups took it to a wrong level. Later followers of Ali, later supporters of Ali, Shia to Ali, later supporters of Ali took it to a wrong level. But at this stage, we begin to see the very beginnings of this notion. So Muhammad Hassan is hesitant. He didn't want to hear the name of Uthman number three. Not that he's anti-Uthman, but again, he wants his father to be number two, or number one, or if not, the number three, right? So he is the one who then blurts out before even the father can answer. And again, this is, at this stage, there's nothing wrong with it per se. And it is also narrated in the Mustadrak of Al-Hakim that somebody asked Ali ibn Abi Talib that, لِمَ لَن تَسْتَخْلِفُ Why don't you tell us who will be the Khalifa after you? Tell us explicitly, after all of this bloodshed, after all of this problem, just get rid of us with all of this fitna of who's going to be next. Tell us, who do you want after you? So, he says, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam lam yastakhlif. He didn't leave a Khalifa. He didn't say who should be the Khalifa after him. So, I shall follow his sunnah. I'm not going to mention anybody. But if Allah wants good for the people, then he shall gather them around their best as he gathered them and around their best after the death of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So I'm not going to leave anybody, but if Allah wants good, you will choose the best person. As what happened when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam died, we chose the best person. So explicitly he is referring Abu Bakr Siddiq is the best person. And Imam Ahmad has another book other than the Mustad, it's called Fada'il al-Sahaba, The Blessings of the Sahaba. And this is Imam Ahmad's book, uh, a book of hadith. And in it we find a narration from Ali that says, If anybody considers me better than Abu Bakr and Umar, then I shall punish him the punishment of a slanderer. If anybody considers me better than Abu Bakr and Umar, I shall punish him the punishment of a slanderer. This is slandering. It's not true. And I will punish him the punishment of the slander. Now pause here. The very fact he has to make this statement demonstrates what? It's happening. It's happening. It has begun. He doesn't know of anybody directly. But the background chatter has begun. Right? And this is the beginnings of Shiism. Even in his own lifetime, the chatter has begun. 
and he is trying to clean up this. His, he does not want it to grow. But amran kana maf'ula, it was going to happen, and that is indeed what happened. And one of the most interesting phenomena of this early period is the many intermarriages between the family of Abu Bakr and the family of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the family of Ali. And this shows our perspective. And it is one of the most awkward things for the other group. Because the other group has this narrative that Ali, Astaghfirullah, that's what they say, despised Abu Bakr and Umar. And he considered them to be either evil or worse than this. So then how do you explain all of these intermarriages that we're going to talk about? This is one of the most awkward things that they really don't have a logical explanation for. And the explanations they have are really somewhat bizarre. Somewhat bizarre. And we begin with the marriage of within Ali and Abu Bakr, Asma bint Umais. Asma bint Umais, that lady who was initially married to Ja'far as Sadiq. And then Ja'far became a shaheed in the battle of Mu'ta. And Ja'far is the full brother of Ali. Remember, Ja'far is the full brother of Ali. And then Asma becomes a widow. So Abu Bakr proposes for her hand. And Abu Bakr marries her for barely uh, a few years. And when uh, Abu Bakr passes away, of course Abu Bakr has a son from her. And that son is? Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr, the one that we mentioned in the story of Uthman. That's Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr, right? He's not technically a Sahabi as we said. He was born after the Prophet so he's not a Sahabi. So Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr. Then, after the death of Abu Bakr, Ali then proposes for Asma's hand. So Asma has been married to Ja'far, and then Abu Bakr, and then Ali. And we show, with this shows us, as do 101 incidents, that in that society there was no stigma of divorce as is in our society. In that society a lady that was divorced was not viewed with a stigma. She was not at all anything that is taboo. Whereas in our cultures there is this taboo of uh, a divorced lady is somehow evil or polluted or she should not be married. Rather this is Asma twice widowed. And she already has children from Ja'far and children from Abu Bakr. And Ali does not mind. And he could have, he is the Khalifa, he could have married anybody. But he wants to marry Asma because of her akhlaq, because of her iman, because of her taqwa. She is a noble lady. And he has no problems with the fact that she has two sets of kids. Imagine, two sets of kids she has from two different husbands. And Ali did not mind. And she then marries Ali radiallahu an, And... From Ali, she has a son, Yahya. So, Yahya and Muhammad are brothers from the same mother. And their fathers are Ali and Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. You tell me. Think about that. Literally, the bloods of Abu Bakr and Ali are now combined in two brothers. This is the reality that... How do you explain? You're going to say there was hatred and animosity. And to make matters even more clear, when Abu Bakr married, uh, sorry, when Ali married Asma, Muhammad was a baby. Muhammad was a baby. So Ali raised Muhammad in his own household and considered him, meaning treated him like a son. Treated him like a son. Gave him responsibilities, taught him the arts of war and manliness and leadership, and then made him a governor of Egypt in his Khilafah. How can anybody say that there was hatred and animosity when the son of Abu Bakr is treated like a son to Ali? You see, very explicit over here, and this is again awkward for any other group to uh, misinterpret or reinterpret. And as we said, Ali had, mashallah, tabarakallah, over uh, 15 or 17 children. And he had plenty of sons and daughters. And one of the sons that he had, he named him Abu Bakr. And this son, Abu Bakr, was born when Ali was Khalifa. 25 years after the death of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. 30 years after the death of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. Now, a son is born and he calls him Abu Bakr. And the other group says, so what? Abu Bakr was a common name. And the response is, no it wasn't. 
No, it wasn't. Go look up the books of history. Abu Bakr was an unknown or very rare name. And then, even if we say it was a mediocre name, not meaning in terms of commonality, right? If there is a mortal enemy to you, do you name your son after that mortal enemy? Think about it. Suppose you have the worst fight and the guy you know, steals your money or takes your status as they claim Abu Bakr did. Is that name even going to come to you when you have a son? Of course not. It's not going to come simply because of your own bitter experiences with another person. Correct? So then how can the claim be that Abu Bakr al-Siddiq's name is taken by Ali and is given to his own son? The reality which is undeniable Ali radiallahu an is taking pride in the achievements of Abu Bakr and like any one of us we name our children Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Ali after those people he is naming his own son after Abu Bakr as-Siddiq how can you explain this except with the obvious and that is that he is expecting his son to follow in the footsteps of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq and it is also mentioned now, so the, the, the legacies goes on, the, the intermarriages and the whatnot. It is also mentioned now that Hussein ibn Ali, so this is Hussein, the grandson, right? And Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr, so we have Hussein and Muhammad, clear, right? The both of them, they married full sisters. And so their children were first cousins. So Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr and Hussein, the grandson of the Prophet. Clear? Right? The both of them, they married full sisters and they had children from these sisters. And so, once again, the blood of Abu Bakr and the blood of Ali are now family, first cousins. And who was the, the family that they married? Who was the sisters that they married? This is very interesting, actually, uh, that the uh, mothers were, that we're talking about here. Um, and by the way, both of these sons were of the most famous of the Tabi'un Taba Tabi'un. Both of these were of the most famous. Who is the son of Hussein? The son of Hussein, guys. Ali Zain al-Abidin. Ali Zain al-Abidin. And who is the most famous son of Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr? Maybe you didn't know this. This is, this is fiqhi students know this. Every fiqh student and every student of usul al-fiqh and the history of uh, the, the fuqaha knows this because Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr, uh, Ibn Taymiyyah says, his son was more famous than the father, the son of Muhammad. Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr, his son was more famous than the father. Al-Qasim. Al-Qasim ibn Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr. Okay, Al-Qasim ibn Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr was one of the, this is footnote here, one of the tabi'un, one of the fuqaha al-sab'a of Medina. Pause here. At the turn of the century, 100 Hijra, there were seven in Medina who were considered to be the encyclopedias of knowledge, who were considered to be the, the best of the best. And this is the time of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. This is the time of the glorious period. And all fiqh goes back to them. That's why every student of fiqh knows their name. Fiqhi positions, fiqhi fatawa, the narrators of hadith. This is like the seven giants. Most of them were students of the, uh, most of them were sons of the Sahaba, right? Most of them were sons or grandsons, as in the case of Al Qasim. Most of them were sons or grandsons uh, of the Sahaba, and these are the uh, seven. Uh, of the uh, fuqaha sab'a, they're called the seven fuqaha, and of them is Al Qasim ibn Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr. Okay, so Al Qasim ibn Muhammad and Ali Zain al Abidin are first cousins. Clear? Who are their mothers that are full sisters? The daughters of Yazdajard. The daughters of Yazdajard. So the uh, time of Umar ibn al Khattab. When the Sassanid Empire collapses, the family of Yazdijard becomes Abid and Amaz. And two daughters of Yazdijard are there. And Umar ibn al-Khattab needs to find suitable people 
for the princesses. This is royalty. You don't just, this is the best of the best need to be given uh, these two. So he chooses the sons of Abu Bakr and the sons of Ali. This is Umar doing this. Imagine. This is Umar ibn Khattab giving one of the daughters of Yazdajad to Hussein and the other daughter of Yazdajad to Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr and the both of them then have these two sons who are now first cousins and the both of these sons are world famous and in fact not just world famous the, the lineage of Islam everything depends on them and in fact the irony of ironies so from the nasl of Hussein all of his children passed away or killed in Karbala except Ali Zain al this is the one right so the very people who curse Umar ibn al-Khattab don't realize there would not have been a nasl for Ali and Hussein had it not been for Umar radiallahu an gifting because it's his decision. This is the Khalifa's decision that who to give uh, the ghanaim and the booty to, who to give them. And so the Khalifa, Umar chose Hussein. And this shows there's no animosity or hatred. And he's choosing the best to give the daughters of Yazdajar to. And so he's the one who chose Hussein. And had it not been for Allah telling him, to, or you know, not telling him, but Qadr Allah, that, that, that Hussein was chosen, there would be no lineage of Imams Aslan. And there would be no Al al Bayt Aslan. Look at the irony. Wallahi, look at the irony. The very people that don't like Umar al-Khattab, were it not for his decision by Allah's will and qadr, there would be nothing that the whole religion is based on. You, you get the point here, right? So once again though, the point for our lecture is to find the intermarriages between uh, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq and between uh, uh, Ali radiallahu an uh, to show the realities of the close relationship. And one final um, intermarriage, one final intermarriage, uh, which is extremely significant as well, is the sixth Imam of the Twelver Imam at Shia. And the sixth Imam is the most famous Imam after the first and second. And that is Imam, the sixth Imam, all of you should know. Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq is the most famous Imam after Hassan and Hussein. Ja'far al-Sadiq. And Ja'far al-Sadiq was the greatest scholar of his era as well. And Imam Abu Hanifa actually studied with Ja'far al-Sadiq. And we... Uh, our perspective on all of these first six Imams is that they are not anything other than Sunnis. We don't view them as being deviant or anything. They are all upon the correct theology and there are people of fiqh and ibadah and taqwa. And uh, Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq, and he is indeed an Imam to us, not like they consider Imam, but we can call, also call him the great Imam, like we say Imam Abu Hanifa, that type of Imam, we also say Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq, not their version of Imam. So when I say Imam Ja'far, I don't mean anything other than Imam Abu Hanifa and Imam al-Shafi'i. Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq would boast, Waladani Abu Bakr marratain. Abu Bakr is my father double. This is Ja'far al-Sadiq boasting that Abu Bakr is a double father to me. Now, how so? Okay, follow along. A little bit complicated, but I'm going into some detail. Why? Because you understand these historic facts are of the easiest ways that you can clarify our position is correct. Because you can't deny history. Even they cannot deny this lineage. So Ja'far al-Sadiq is saying, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq is double my father. How so? Because Ja'far al-Sadiq, his mother was... Umm Farwa bint Qasim ibn Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr. Okay? Qasim, the one we just talked about, right? Her daughter, Umm Farwa. So Ja'far al-Sadiq's mother is the daughter of Al-Qasim. Clear so far? Yes. Okay, one more thing. Don't get confused. Very easy. This Umm Farwa, she is the product of a consanguine marriage, i.e. two cousins. This Umm Farwa, her mother and her father are first cousins. Clear? So, her father is the grandson of Abu Bakr. And her mother is the granddaughter of Abu Bakr. Okay? Who is her mother? Her mother 
is Asma binti Abdul Rahman ibn Abi Bakr. Who is Abdul Rahman ibn Abi Bakr? Well, obviously, but who is Abdul Rahman? The full brother of of Aisha. Okay, Abdul Rahman is the full brother of Aisha. Okay, so Abdul Rahman had a daughter, Asma. So Asma married her first cousin Qasim ibn Muhammad. So Qasim ibn Muhammad marries Asma binti Abdul Rahman, both from Abu Bakr. So they are first cousins. So the first cousins marry one another, and then they have Umm Farwa. So Umm Farwa is a pure, mashallah, Abu Bakr descendant, right? You get the point. Both sets of grandparents go back to Abu Bakr. And so Umm Farwa was of the uh, descendants of Abu Bakr. And then, of course, don't forget the Ja'far al-Sadiq's grandmother as well, back to the early times as well, is also from Abu Bakr's descendants. And it is narrated uh, in Ja'far al-Sadiq's uh, um, fatawa. So Ja'far al-Sadiq, by the way, is the real founder of Shi'i fiqh. That's why they call it Ja'fari fiqh. Because after Ja'far al-Sadiq. Ja'far al-Sadiq founded his own madhab. Just like Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Shafi, they founded their madhabs. Ja'far al-Sadiq founded his own madhab. And his madhab is very similar to the Hanafi madhab. Because they're both in Kufa area. They're both taken from the Kufan sources. So Hanafi Madhab and Ja'fari Madhab is actually very similar together. So the Hanafis here, for example, don't eat types of sea fish. The Ja'fari Madhab cannot also eat the sea fish as well, other than the fish. They cannot eat the lobsters and the shrimps and whatnot. So you see all of these uh, overlaps between the Ja'fari Madhab and the, uh, and the Hanafi Madhab. So the point is that in his Madhab, one of his students asked him, what is your verdict on gold on the uh, scabbard of the sword? So you know the sword is put in, or the handle of the sword. You know, so gold is put in something, or the, the handle of the sword. Because you know, rich uh, uh, people put some jewels and some gold to decorate the sword. Okay, and some silver, something like this. And generally speaking, men are discouraged from having these types of things, right? Um, uh, and the Hanafi Madhab, by the way, allows men, just FYI, to have a small, insignificant amount of gold. As decoration, not a pure gold, but maybe like gold plating, for example. The Hanafi madhab, classical Hanafi madhab, allowed. The other three don't allow it. Imam Jaafar allowed it. Imam Jaafar al-Sadiq allowed it. And so Jaafar al-Sadiq said in his fatwa, "La ba'sa bi dalik." There's no problem. There's no problem if the scabbard or the, the 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 hilt has this type of jewelry and gold on it. For Abu Bakr Siddiq had the same in his scabbard. The student said, Ataqulu as siddiq Are you going to call him as siddiq Pause here. Why is his student asking? Why is his student asking? Clearly, by now there is something going on. And by now they're wondering. Or there's debate. So by the time of Ja'far al-Sadiq, and we're talking about 140 Hijrah, roughly, right? There are two strands of what is called Shi'ism. A little bit advanced here, but I know everybody wants to know this stuff. So I'll tell you a little bit. I'm not going to go into too detail. There are two strands of Shi'ism. There is, let's call this the Kufan strand. And then there is the Madani strand. Okay? There are two strands of Shi'ism at this point in time. There's the Kufan strand. There's the Madani strand. The Madani strand is the strand of the actual Al al-Bayt, the actual Imams. That's the Madani strand, because they are living in Medina. In Kufa, as of yet, it's going to happen soon, but as of yet, there's no Al al-Bayt right now. It's going to happen soon, and they're going to transfer over over there. But right now, they're not living in Kufa. They're living in Medina. So the Madani strand, what is their basic premise? That... The Al al Bayt have more of a right to be Khalifa than the Banu Hashim, than the Banu Umayyah, excuse me. Right? The Al al Bayt are more deserving than the Banu Umayyah. Who are the Banu Umayyah? It's our prerogative. Generally speaking, they didn't talk about Abu Bakr and Umar. That's the past. And it's not that much of a concern to them. Their main concern is right here and now, we are more rightful than these people. And frankly, who would disagree? 
we wouldn't disagree. In terms of theoretically, who would be more righteous and pious? Right? The Umayyads don't have any the theology to, 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 to say. So there's nothing wrong with saying that. So this uh, strand of Shi'ism is not theological, it is political. Political. There's no theology. They're not saying that the Bani Umayyah are deviants because they have rejected. They're simply saying we are. We have more right to be Khilafah than them. In Kufa, on the other side of the world from that perspective, another strand of Shi'ism is developing. And there are no actual descendants of Ali leading that strand right now. Eventually, they're going to lead it in the seventh, eighth generation. That's another hundred years down the line, not now. And that's why we differentiate between the early Imams, the first six, seven, and then the last two or three are very different, very different. And in fact, many of them embrace this respect and this uh, things that were given to them. Uh, so the Kufan Shi'ism develops a theology that the Al al Bayt are designated by Allah to be the rulers. Hmm, clear? And therefore they are supernatural in their capabilities. They have ilm al ghaib or they can do this, or they can do that. They began speaking like this about them. How can they speak about them like this? Because they've never met them. They're not interacting with them. They're living in a la faraway land, and theology begins to develop. And the theology then goes that the Al al Bayt should always have been the Khalifa from the very beginning of time. And therefore, this includes Abu Bakr and Umar. This is Kufan Shi'ism. Okay? This is Kufan Shi'ism. So, pause here. I'm going to give you one example afterwards. Let's get back to our story now. So, the student says, Do you say a Siddiq? Because the student is well aware that there are strands. And I know there are people that say that you guys don't like Abu Bakr. How can you say a Siddiq? So, the narration says that Ja'far al-Sadiq was leaning on the wall. He leaned forward. And he said, Yes, indeed, he is a Siddiq. Yes, indeed, he is a Siddiq. Yes, indeed, he is a Siddiq. And whoever doesn't say that he is a Siddiq, فَلَا صَدَّقَهُ اللَّهِ Then Allah, may Allah never consider him to be true and verify him in this world and the next. In other words, he cursed the one who did not call Abu Bakr a Siddiq. This is Ja'far al-Sadiq. Of course he's a Siddiq. And the most explicit reality that differentiates the difference between Kufan Shi'ism and Madani Shi'ism is the birth of the first real strand of Shi'ism that's still around, around to our time, and that is Zaydi Shi'ism. Okay? Zaydism, which is now in Yemen, the Houthis in Yemen, um, 9.5 million uh, Shia in the world are Zaydis. And as I said many times before, the Zaydis are the only branch of Shi'is that you can't tell, feel sympathy for because the Sunnis think they're Shi'i and the Shi'is think they're Sunni. They're right in the middle. They're right in the middle. And both groups disassociate themselves from them. The Sunnis consider them to be the beginnings of the Shayyur. And the Shia, 12 verse, consider them to be the end of Sunnism. So they're in that middle ground, right? And Zaydi Shi'ism, memorize this, and as you inshallah study more, you'll understand it. Zaydi Shi'ism presents a window for us into Madani Shi'ism of early times. And Twelver Shi'ism represents the developments of Kufan Shi'ism. Okay? Twelver Shi'ism. Now, what, what is the incident I'm talking about? Which again goes back to the fact that the actual Al al Bayt respected Abu Bakr al Umar. That's our position. And the books of history prove it. And Zaydi Shi'ism proves it. To this day, Zaydi Shia, by and large, even though I have to say to be accurate, unfortunately, later Zaydis have been influenced by the Twelvers. And some strands amongst them are saying this. But there are two strands of Zaydi Shiism now. One strand that is now saying what the Twelvers say about Abu Bakr Umar, but classical Zaydi Shiism and the mainstream strand, they say that Abu Bakr and Umar were acceptable Khulafa. They were righteous people. They don't curse them. They don't consider them to be bad, but they say, 
Ali was better than them and he should have been Khalifa. Okay? So from our perspective, this position is the beginning step of Shi'ism, correct? To say that Ali should have been Khalifa, not Abu Bakr. This is the slightest beginning of Shi'ism. So we say Zaydis are Shia. Correct? From the Twelver perspective, if you say that Abu Bakr and Umar were legitimate, you're not a Shi'i. You're a Sunni. Even if you say Ali should have been, but Abu Bakr was permissible. That's what the Zaydis say. So from the Twelver perspective, the Zaydis are Sunni. Because they respect Abu Bakr and Umar enough to say radiallahu anhum and to say their khilafah is legitimate. And anybody who says their khilafah is legitimate from their perspective is not a true Shi'i. So the Zaydis are smack in the middle, 9 million people in the world today. And theologically, they don't believe that their Imam is superhuman. They don't believe their Imam has ilm al ghaib and their Imam can fly and snap his fingers and resurrect the dead. Whereas the Ithna Asharis, the powers they give the Imam, and this is, you know me, I'm not a person who smears or whatnot. The powers they give their Imam are powers that we would really only give to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They give these types of powers and they say, the Imam has been blessed with these types of powers. The Imam can do whatever he wants and resurrect the dead and control the creation and whatnot. This is their perception. And this is uh, Kufa and Shi'ism. So, uh, one incident before we move on uh, to, the, to, the, to the next uh, stories about Umar, that perhaps the most famous incident in this regard was, as we said, the birth of Zaydism. And why am I talking about all of this now? To demonstrate the descendants of Ali respected Abu Bakr and Umar. And the most blatant example, which historically cannot be denied because we have a firqa that was formed because of it, was the first time Madani Shi'ism met Kufan Shi'ism officially face to face. The result was a rupture that caused the birth of Zaydism. What happened? Zayd ibn Ali ibn Hussein. So the great great grandson of the Prophet Hussein. Hussein son Ali Zayn Abidin, right? Ali's son Zayd. So this is Ja'far al Sadiq's uncle. Ja'far al Sadiq's uncle. Okay? Ali's son, Zayd. Zayd ibn Ali ibn Hussein. You know, you all understand. Zayd ibn Ali ibn Hussein. Hussein, the grandson. Hussein's grandson is Zayd. Wanted to lead a revolt against the Abbasids now. Not the Umayyads anymore, they're gone. The Abbasids. And deja vu all over again. He's in Medina. Where do you think the army is volunteering itself from? Kufa. Once again, deja vu. All over again. Kufa was always the hotbed. Kufa is the birth of theological Shi'ism. Kufa was always wanting to rebel against the Umayyads and the Abbasids. So the people of Kufa want a revolt and they need a leader figure. And Zayd begins correspondence just like his great grandfather, his grandfather Hussein, began the correspondence. And his relatives warn him, they have, they have already destroyed your grandfather, how could you accept? But he got the solemn oaths and he got thousands and thousands of people. They said we have more than 10,000 people. The same promises, right? And so, Zayd ibn Ali left Medina, but he didn't get stopped at Karbala this time. He actually made it to Kufa. He made it to Kufa. What year is this? 122 AH. 122 AH. Okay? So this is, again, two generations after Karbala, right? This is the grandfather and the grandson now. He actually makes it to Kufa. And the people are overjoyed. And they literally are. Some reports say there were over 12,000 people. And if he had succeeded, then literally there would have been a revolution and the Abbasids would have gone. 12,000 is a huge number. But what happened? Kufa and Shi'ism meets Madani Shi'ism and the two don't get along. They began to interrogate him. Who's interrogating whom? These are the followers, their Imam has come. But they want to verify their Imam. Are you worthy of being an Imam or not? Look at again, the arrogance, right? Who are you? Who is he? You're supposed to be the followers of this Imam. You're the one who says he's the Imam. You're the one who put him up there. You're the one who says he's going to lead you into battle. But now that he's come, all of a sudden interrogation begins. What do you say about this? What do you say about that? And the main question, 
ما تقول في أبي بكر وعمر What is your position about Abu Bakr and Umar? This is the interrogation. This is the mihna that Zayd is going to get. And Zayd said, now listen to this. This is well known. Every book of history mentions this. And this is now, we're talking about 122 Hijrah. It's not even early, early Islam. It's now we're getting you know, to a much later time. There are people that are contemporaneous writing about this. We know what happened. He says in the masjid in front of all the people, listen to him. I have never heard any of my family and ancestors say anything but good about those two. This is a fourth generation, Al Al Bayt, born and raised in Medina, meeting the Kufan Shias for the first time. And he is telling them, What's your problem, guys? I am from the Al Al Bayt. I am telling you, my entire family has never spoken one word against them. This is the testimony, Shahida Shahidu min ahliha. This is the testimony coming straight from the Medina and Al Bayt. And he says, Wazirayu Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the two wazirs of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, how could I say anything but good of them? The only thing we say, the only thing that we say is that we felt we had more of a right than them of governance. But they took charge and they were just and they did a good job and they acted according to the Quran and Sunnah. And the fact that they chose the governing over us does not make them kafir in our eyes. This is Zaydi Shiism. Exactly to this day, mainstream Zaydi Shiism. And we also see very clearly that this is not pure Sunnism as well. Let's be honest to the sources. And that's fine. Because they're not claiming Abu Bakr and Umar astaghfirullah were sinful. They're claiming they made an ishtihad. And that's fine. We disagree with that ishtihad. And Zayd is saying, we felt we had more of a right than they did. But they acted good and just and they acted according to the Quran and Sunnah and we have nothing against them. This is a middle ground between mainstream Sunnism and between 12 or Shiism. You see what I'm saying here, right? Because mainstream Sunnism does not agree with this. But mainstream Sunnism... Well, anyway, let's not get into that theology. I'm, my theology is coming out and I love this. To this type of stuff, I love it. I go into hours and hours. It's not what you're here for. Actually, this is not even supposed to be done today. All of this was just quickly, but you see how excited I get when I talk about these issues. In any case, where was I? Tayyip. So, Zayd ibn Ali basically testifies, testifies that the Al Al Bayt of his generation, and that's fourth and fifth generation now, he is saying none of them say anything about Abu Bakr and Umar illa khaira, other than good. I have never heard anything about them other than good. They made an ishtihad, we might disagree, but hey, they weren't evil people and we respect them. So this is Madani Shi'ism. And it still exists in bits and forms in Zaydism. Okay? And when the Twelver Shia, well they're not Twelvers yet, when the Kufan Shia heard this, they said, you cannot be our Imam. And Zayd was shocked. Like, what do you mean? What alternative do you have? I mean, I'm the one that has come from Medina. You don't even have an Al Bayt. And in his shock, he said, Arafaltumuni, have you rejected me? And because of this, the moniker or the nickname Rafida was invented against them. Okay? Have you rejected me? Like he couldn't believe. Like, because of these issues, you are making it so big of a deal that we have a bigger thing to do. We have to fight for justice. We have to, I mean, from his perspective, you know, overthrow the, the Abbasid dynasty. and You know, whatever. This is a political issue. It's not a theological one. Frankly, we are neither for the Abbasids nor against them. And to be brutally honest, our sympathies are probably more with the Al Al Bayt at this time than, than the governing uh, you know, people. Remember what happened yesterday? We talked about what's happening you know, on the other side of the thing, right? These are the rulers. These are muttaqun. Zayd and Ja'far al These are people, awliya, salihun, al al bayt. How can your sympathy not be for them? Right? So, but the point is, they are not making a theology out of it. Whereas the Kufans are making a theology out of it. You see the point? And so Zayd says, 
are you guys going to reject me over this? And they rejected him. The bulk of them abandoned him. And so he went into battle with barely a few thousand. And he could have had 12, 15,000. The bulk of them abandoned him. He went into battle and he died at the hands of the Abbasids. Because you cannot fight an entire army with a few thousand. And the remnants of his followers fled from the Muslim lands. And they made their way down south to Yemen. And they started a small dynasty over there that in essence lasted up until 1961. Or somebody correct me. The Arabs, 60, 61 or 62, something like this, right? This Zaydi dynasty lasted up until the coming of the uh, country, the modern country of Yemen. And the Houthi rebels basically now... Uh, you know, have their complaints against the Sunni uh, thing. But Yemen was a bastion of Zaydism for 1,200 years because the followers of Zayd, they fled down to Yemen and they started their little province. They had their own little island, or not island, their own little area, and they continued Zaydism uh, down there. Anyway, returning to our story, all of this tangent was really just to demonstrate that the family of Ali and the family of Abu Bakr did not have any animosity between them. And very quickly then, uh, in the reign of uh, Umar ibn al-Khattab as well. Oh, I forgot to mention. So when Abu Bakr passed away, radiallahu anh, Umar uh, Ali was there, obviously Ali was there. And Ali praised Abu Bakr and Ali radiallahu anh, when he saw the body of Abu Bakr covered up. He said, may Allah have mercy on you that I would not want to meet Allah with anybody else's good deeds other than yours. In other words, I am proud of what I have done to the point of I don't envy anybody. I want to meet Allah with my record. But if I could substitute anybody's record, then it would be your record. And this he said as Abu Bakr's body is lying covered. His corpse is there. And he is saying this in front of the Muslims. So, what does that show about the status of Abu Bakr in the eyes of Ali radiallahu anh? Someone as great as Ali says, I would not want to meet Allah with anybody else's deeds. I'm not jealous of anybody. But your deeds, I am jealous of them. Po je positive jealousy. That you have done what nobody else has um, done. Um, and um, in the reign of Umar uh, as well, now we're subhanAllah very close to the end here and we have to make a number of announcements. So... Uh, Allah I had all of Umar's Khilafah as well, but I got so excited about the Al al Bayt and the Shia, and I think it's your fault for this, you know, uh, because I know you're interested. You, the first time I saw you take notes was over this issue. <laughs> it's the first time ever he's taking notes. It's Sunnism, Shia, is a Allah. So in any case, I think we'll have to pause there because we have some very important announcements. Otherwise, well, I had everything prepared for the Khilaf of Umar and beginning of Uthman. But we will delay that, inshallah, till next um, uh, Wednesday.